So w welcome to this uh, uh, panel. It's a pleasure to be representing Flinders University here. And we'll begin by, could you say a little bit about how you contribute to building a creative industries and here in Adelaide, in South Australia? And maybe we could just, each can, of you can mm -hmm. start introducing themselves and say a bit about that. Sure. Um, so my name's Kate Crozer. I'm the new CEO of the South Australian Film Corporation. Very much enjoying my time there so far. Um, I'm incredibly lucky because it's a very exciting time to be taking up the helm at the SAFC. Um, we are really having some great success in the South Australian screen industry. Um, the top three grossing Australian films at the box office this year were all produced in South Australia. We also have had incredible success with a homegrown television series called The Hunting, which was fully developed and produced in South Australia by a South Australian company and South Australian creatives. And uh, that production is SBS's um, uh, top performing Australian drama series ever. Um, and I would be, it would be very remiss of me not to mention the uh, fantastic Mortal Kombat that we have shooting in town at the moment, the biggest production ever to come to South Australia, based on the you know incredibly successful video game franchise and produced by New Line Cinema and Warner Brothers, and we do have the director, Simon McCoy, in the room today. Thank you. Even though they're in production, Simon's still here, so thank you, Simon. Um, in terms of the economic impact on uh, the state, of the um, screen industry, the, a few years back the SAFC commissioned a report by Deloitte's um, looking at the impact of the film and television sector. Uh, so in the 2017-2018 year, um, the, the industry contributed $119.5 million to the GSP and employed nearly 1,200 um, FTE uh, roles. Um, so it is a significant economic impact, but also even more than that, um, you know, what's worth mentioning is screen production um, also has huge flow-on benefits in other industries, like, you know, especially in other creative industries, like advertising, professional services, music, um, you know, and then also tourism, hospitality, and retail. So the, the spend that happens for a a film production is really quite varied and it impacts across many other industries. Great. And so I, can, I should actually mention a little bit, sorry, before I go on, um, about what the SAFC does. So the South Australian Film Corporation is tasked with um, supporting the growth of the South Australian screen sector. So we do that through a number of different sort of mechanisms, um, one being the incentives that we offer. So we have a production incentive which levers a 10 to 1 spend in the state and um, also supports sort of capability and um, job creation. And we also have a really successful post-production digi digital visual effects, it's a mouthful, uh, rebate um, which has been in operation for a couple of years um, and is really seeing some great results. Um, and we also um, operate the Adelaide Studios, which is a really significant um, state-of-the-art complex based at Glenside. Thank you. Thank you. Cabral. I'm Cabral Rock. I'm the executive producer at Mill Film. Uh, Mill Film is a relatively uh, new, a reborn visual effects entity uh, that's been back in existence for uh, the last year, a little over a year. So we have two studios, one based in Montreal in Canada, one based in Adelaide, South Australia. The uh, Adelaide office has been open for uh, the better part of a year now, um, and that's what brought me to Adelaide from Singapore. I relocated here to be part of the rebirth of Mill Film. I believe I was employee number eight, if I remember correctly, and uh, as of today, we're uh, 400 employees, so it's uh, tremendous growth mm. for uh, a visual effects studio. That's tremendous growth for any kind of business. Um, we've done all of that while having uh, four active productions over the course of 2019. By the end of the year, we will have del delivered almost 2,000 visual effects, uh, individual visual effects shots, which is a tremendous achievement for year one. 
um, aside from just that volume of growth and the number of uh, roles that we're, we're creating within South Australia, we also have uh, a training program, which is the Technicolor Academy. Uh, it's a program that's across all the brands of Technicolor, which is the parent company uh, of, of which Mill Film is a part. That program has yielded uh, 60 graduates uh, in 2019, uh, all of whom, uh, with the exception of, I think, one, uh, for personal circumstances, have continued on to be uh, employed at the company. So in a, not only are we uh, bringing local talent back to Australia who potentially had to go abroad to chase opportunities elsewhere, uh, but we're also investing in the next generation of talent as well in partnership with the local schools. Uh, we're tremendously excited uh, to move into year two, uh, where we continue to grow both in terms of uh, uh, the size of the studio, the number of employees that we have, but also start to partner with uh, more local productions as well and see that uh, local ecosystem uh, strengthen and become tighter. Right. Hi, everybody. My name is Rochelle Gibson. I'm um, the Director of Marketing and Industry Partnerships at Ausfilm. And Ausfilm is based in Sydney. We have uh, a staff of seven and we also have an uh, office in Los Angeles. And uh, we are, um, I guess, a, a unique partnership between the Australian government and the screen industry. We have a membership of over 50 entities, and that includes uh, the Australian federal and state territor and territory screen agencies. Uh, so the South Australian Film Corporation is a member of Ausfilm, as are Resin, Kojo, Rising Sun and Mill Film, who are here today. <coughs> uh, we also uh, have a membership of all of the major studios around Australia, so the studios in Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria, and of course, as I said, South Australia, uh, and uh, visual effects companies, post-production and screen service businesses. Uh, and we receive a, a grant from the Commonwealth Government through the Department of Communications and the Arts, and the purpose of that grant is to help us promote the federal tax incentives and we do that globally. Uh, obviously, the major market for us is the US, uh, and our secondary markets then are Canada, uh, China, and the UK. So really, our role is to attract uh, foreign production into Australia uh, and ensure that it actually spreads across all of the states and isn't just pulled in one area. Um, and uh, I guess the other um, point to make is that with our membership, we run international outbound programs, so we take a delegation of our members overseas to help them connect into uh, the screen industry in, um, in Los Angeles or New York or um, Canada or China. Um, we also run a program for Australian producers uh, in the Los Angeles market, uh, Anna being uh, one of the recipients of that program, uh, which is around partnering um, Australian producers with American development and production companies with the outcome of them um, finding finance out of the US uh, or partners to bring the projects back to Australia. So our intention is always foreign direct uh, investment back into Australia and Australian screen businesses. Mm. Uh, and I'll just make the point that um, uh, the federal government have been uh, very supportive, particularly recently they introduced a new incentive grant uh, last year which uh, enable us to attract in the last 14 months eight major film and television productions out of the US which have been scattered along the eastern coast and uh, uh, of Australia, uh, which is equated to around what we've estimated currently at $670 million and uh, 12,000 FTE uh, positions as well as 6,000 businesses who are actually benefiting from that production. So it's, it's you know, hugely significant in terms of the investment into Australia. So that's what Ausfilm does. Hi, um, I'm an independent film producer which means I work for myself, <laughs> <laughs> but with the support of Ausfilm and, of course, the South Australian Film Corporation. Um, just demystifying what that process is, being an independent producer, we look for content. Um, it could be a script someone's written. It could be an introduction that's come through Ausfilm. It may be an article in a newspaper. We develop up that content. We look for its key marketability um, in order to be able to finance it. Um, we attach directors, actors, or director actors. Um, we then set about trying to finance that particular production. Um, if we're successful, which hopefully we are, um, that usually involves about 25% gap, uh, which we try and raise out of the market. It more often than not comes internationally. And I think that that's really important discussing that in an essay context because I'm a completely homegrown South Australian born and bred. Uh, Narracourt via Keith, so you know, <laughs> for many years. Um, 
and even though I'm living and working here and we have our office at Adelaide Studios, we function at the level that we do because of the access to um, international investment, support, equity partners. So um, assuming we've raised that money, we then set about production. We try and spend as, as much of that production dollar here in the state because the incentives and rebates are so strong. We set about post-production, often in use, u involving VFX. Um, delivery of the film then to Netflix, or it might be a broadcaster in Australia, or um, um, a studio, distributor, sales agent. So that's essentially what we do. Um, it's challenging, but it's absolutely exhilarating. We are small, but I would like to think that we're very effective. It's me and Bonnie. <laughs> over there. Um, we, our first film that we produced was in 2014 through SLA Films. We have produced $27 million worth of content through the company in a very short time with seven films. I'm currently trying to set up a feature. It's a $9.5 million budget um, that was introduced to me via Ausfilm, which SAFC are supporting hopefully well supporting. We well <laughs> <laughs> have to now. We are now. Okay, anyone here in the media, you just... <laughs> um, so if we're able to achieve uh, that project and Bonnie's working on a documentary and trying to set up another, then this time next year we would have put 40 million through the company. Wow. So that's like really exciting for me. When we're talking about growing the local industry, what's most important about that is that when we raise finance for a project, we are able to pay back our development costs. They are our own costs. That's where we are entrepreneurs. We're spending our own money on a wish and a prayer that we're going to actually be able to get that back. We get our fees when we're able to finance a production um, and that's a great day when those fees <laughs> come through. Kate knows this because she's been an independent producer as well. What we really need is IP. So how much of that project that we are able to retain as a South Australian producer really enables us to determine how much we can continue to invest in future projects. And that might be employing more staff, expanding. I mean, we all grow and shrink depending on which projects we've got coming in and out. Um, but it, when we're having this discussion about growth, this is the most brilliant time for South Australia. I've landed in the right state at the right time with the right projects. Um, as an example of that, we're having a good year. We co-produced I Am Mother. It was a $14 million feature film starring Hilary Swank, shot entirely at the Adelaide Studios and a little bit of exteriors in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. That premiered at Sundance in January of this year and was then picked up by Netflix. And in May of this year, Bonnie and I were in Cannes because a documentary that we produced was selected to screen in Cannes. So we can have a very Im big impact internationally, provided that we get our ducks in a row and we're organising our small businesses in a way that is sustainable and profitable. Mm -hmm. Great, fantastic, sounds wonderful. So ov over lunch we spoke quite a little bit about what it takes to keep production, bringing productions to Australia and bringing productions to South Australia in particular. So what is it that, that we do well here in, in, in South Australia and why is it such an attractive place for, for example, mill films to come to Adelaide? Well, I think with the nature of visual effects and post-production, you have both a, a burgeoning youth movement of people that want to get into high-tech jobs. Um, Adelaide's uniquely positioned as being a university town. There's plenty of educational institutions here uh, to service those young people that want to get into the business. Uh, we need mechanisms in place to receive them and be able to give them opportunities, otherwise they're going to go elsewhere. Uh, visual effects specifically is a uh, nomadic industry, so there's projects that are positioned at different studios all over the world. Uh, a lot of artists are going to be attracted by those projects and, and chase them to studios uh, here, there, and everywhere. In visual effects, uh, almost everybody is a contract employee, so the length of your contract is going to be three to four months, uh, up to a year. When your project is over, if your studio has another project for you, you're likely to stay and continue on for another contract. If it's not, you're going to go elsewhere. 
in a mature post-production ecosystem like a Vancouver or Los Angeles, that might mean going down the road to another shop. If you don't have that option, you're going to leave the city, you're going to leave the state, in some cases you're going to leave the country. So I think what we need to do in South Australia and Adelaide specifically is make sure that we shore up that post-production ecosystem so that the opportunities are there for people uh, when their contracts are done, they don't have to worry about where they're going to go next because they know it's still going to be in South Australia. I think that's that security uh, is also going to have a benefit to uh, specifically the visual effects studios that are here um, to have a uh, dependable and mature workforce as well to rely on. And that in turn will attract more work and bigger projects and the cycle continues. Mm. And tax incentives help too, don't they? Tax incentives definitely help too. And luckily, South Australia is very competitive in that yeah. regard. Yeah. yeah, so two years ago, we introduced the um, PDV rebate here in South Australia, and that was obviously instrumental in um, encouraging uh, Mill Film to set up here, but it also benefits um, the really world-class um, uh, VFX and post-production companies we have here with Rising Sun Pictures, Kojo, Resin, and, you know, a really fast-growing new company, Artisan, um, all, you know, just servicing huge international production on a regular basis um, out of Adelaide. So that is a very fast-growing um, sort of section of the screen industry. And uh, and um, the other thing to mention in the post-production sphere is, is our post-sound facilities attract a lot of production here um, to Adelaide. So we have the um, Dolby accredited mixing theatre at the Adelaide Studios, which really is the best mixing theatre in the country. And, you know, I've had producers in there saying, um, this is as good as Park Road Post. You know, you can be finishing your film, you know, your, the picture of your film and the sound of, of your film at the same time in a world-class facility. So that post-production um, offering really brings a lot of... Uh, of expenditure to the state. Um, but I think the other thing we offer is um, a really unique combination of um, a, st a studio, like a world-class, a state-of-the-art sort of studio with a really diverse array of found locations. So within a matter of driving an hour from the Adelaide airport, you can get to, um, you know, really cinematic coastal locations, city locations, um, outback, um, or, you know, agricultural. So we c it, it, what, what that means is for productions who want to come here, it reduces their costs uh, because they don't have to spend as much money taking the whole unit around um, to lots of different areas. So um, that's a unique offering that we have in South Australia. Is there, is there anything else that you would say, Rochelle, that's unique uh, about South Australia or why productions would rather come here than go to Sydney or Brisbane? No, I think Kate pretty much covered it. It's, it's really, I mean, in terms of international production, um, uh, going to other jurisdictions outside of California and New York, there are really three basic conditions for that um, to, to work really well. And I think uh, South Australia and, and um, some of the other states offer that, which is really uh, infrastructure. So you need the studios. You need to have a skilled workforce, so cast and crew. Uh, it's much more cost efficient for a production to uh, arrive in a jurisdiction and have a highly skilled cast and crew uh, that have worked on Hollywood productions. So it's a, and, 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 of course, the domestic industry gets the benefit of that training and, and upskilling. Uh, and then I guess the, the third point to make is that you, you have to ensure that you've got certain um, stable tax incentives and you have what underpins that is uh, government support. And, of course, um, the South Australian government has been incredibly supportive yeah. of, um, of the industry here um, in terms of understanding the value of investing into the screen and creative industries but also into infrastructure, which is really, mm -hmm. really key. Mm. It would be great to talk a little bit about the, about the uh, skilled uh, workforce, and I don't only say this from a university perspective, who's of course very keen to produce all those graduates that are ready to go into the industry. So, um, Cabral, can you talk a little bit about the Technicolor Academy? Because it's, I think it's quite a unique um, model, a quite a, a unique idea, and how it works, and and how your experience has been so far. Sure. Um, so Technicolor Academy is uh, across all of the Technicolor brands worldwide, and the idea is that you identify uh, high potential talent uh, coming out of the schools, and there's partnerships in place with the feeder schools in every location that Technicolor has an office. Um, you those 
young people coming out of school, it's not an internship, it's actual uh, training, but it's a paid training program. So the students will do a 10 to 12 week training program specializing on a certain facet of visual effects, whether that be uh, animation, lighting, or uh, environment asset builds. Uh, when they come out of those 10 to 12 weeks, assuming that they've met all the criteria in their training, uh, they transition for the remainder of their 12-month contract into full-time employment with uh, the Technicolor brand, in this case, Mill Film. So it's, it's, it's uniquely positioned to prepare the students for the realities of working in the visual effects industry because the educators, the, the training program, the curriculum is developed by visual effects uh, artists, supervisors, and, and support staff. Um, it's not a uh, arm's reach partnership with uh, another facility. It's actually uh, run directly through Technicolor uh, and the visual effects studio in question. Mm -hmm. So we've had tremendous success. Um, the, the academy graduates that join Mill Film aren't interns. They're not uh, uh, learner uh, employees. They are employees. They have full responsibilities just like anybody else. And they're not treated any different than any other artist. Um, and a lot of them have become our, our top performing artists as well. They're ambitious, they're hungry, they're well trained from their uh, uh, education prior to Technicolor Academy, and they've just been uh, uh, calibrated for the exact needs of our studio. Mm -hmm. So it's been very successful. Yeah. So, so to just to clarify, when you say school, you, you don't mean high school, you actually mean they're coming from an art school. So they have done uh, uh, an arts degree or um, a specialized creative arts degree from, in, from some of the higher uh, education providers here, here here in Adelaide. So they're basically um, a workforce that is, truly speaking, highly skilled because they already have gone through their university education. And then on top of that, to really bring them to the level that's required in the industry, they're going through this Technicolor program, uh, academy program, which is fully paid. So I think that's a really a great opportunity mm. for students um, and high school leavers here um, in, in South Australia and uh, that there are really jobs waiting for them at, at Technicolor Academy, for example, when they come out of university. Absolutely. And because we, these are sustained partnerships with the educational institutions, we give feedback to them as well to, to direct where the next crop of students need to focus and, and where skills maybe need to be um, uh, stepped up as well for the coming year. Mm -hmm. So between the two uh, organizations working together, it's leveling up the, the, the skill set of the, uh, the students that are being output. So in our conversations, I've heard the, you said that really a lot, a Mortal Kombat is a real game changer for South Australia. Why is that? Well, just in terms of what we were just talking about, you know, skilling opportunities, I think that a production, bringing a production of, of the scale of Mortal Kombat to South Australia means that you have a whole, you know, a huge number of South Australian crew. So this is experienced film and television um, crew who are working on that production, but they're working in very specialised departments on very specialised um, uh, pieces of work, which you don't often get the chance to do on smaller scale productions. And they're also learning from world's best. So they're learning from, you know, heads of department who have come here from Hollywood and are actually passing on those skills to a whole generation of South Australian technicians. Um, and another great story out of Mortal Kombat, I think, is, um, you know, the cross-skilling opportunities that are available. So we um, identified that the Mortal Kombat construction department was going to need hundreds of skilled tradespeople. Um, so you're talking carpenters, plasterers, moulders, you know, um, specialised sort of um, technical skills uh, that obviously within the film and television industry alone, we couldn't service that with our existing crew base, but the Department of Innovation and Skills established a mechanism by which the production could access um, a crew, or, you know, skilled technicians from other industries. So they've pulled all, the, all those trades people together, pr you know, given that access to Mortal Kombat, and now those people all have, you know, we're talking hundreds of people have credits on a Hollywood a movie and have been learning from these, um, you know, Hollywood uh, heads of department on a particular trade. So that's a great example of how Mortal Kombat is really, you know, elevating the skills of our workforce. It, it works for us as well. Um, the announcement was right ahead of Cannes, 
and of course we go to a market like Cannes to try and raise finance for the projects we've got in development. And so we could then sit down with the global financiers and say, now our office is in Adelaide and that's where Mortal Kombat <laughs> are just um, <laughs> going into pre-production next week. You've heard of it. And they're like, oh yeah, that's great. Like, completely put us on the map, gave us another feather in our cap um, because your ability to work as an independent producer really relies on your track record. Mm -hmm. um, they, you're going to be researched. They want to know before they're go to consider your project for investment, who you are, what you've done, who you work with, um, where you're based, um, and then obviously incentives help massively. Mm -hmm. um, but the Mortal Kombat, we just took that and put that into our pitch <laughs> on an aeroplane <laughs> in about, oh, we can use that. And um, it's that high visibility is so important. And I find that when we're working internationally as well, um, South Australia doesn't get singled out as the um, smaller, poorer cousin somewhere in the bottom of Australia, like, at all. We're Australian, we're in a meeting that Ausfilm set up in LA, where they see the industry as a whole as being extremely proficient, very good technicians, great locations, um, the standards of the finished Australian films are very high, we've got checks and balances through Screen Australia, through our tax offset programs, and the fact that we're Australian, they want to work with us. They don't care if our office is in Melbourne, or Brisbane, or Sydney. It, it doesn't mean anything to the majority of the people I talk to. And usually, the films that we're discussing are not set on the Sydney Harbour Bridge. No. So, <laughs> it just doesn't, it doesn't matter. They go, all right, Australian, and they usually know other Australians. Mm. So, reputation is huge. Mortal Kombat has really assisted that. We've gone up a lot of rungs very quickly. Mm. Can I just pick up on a point that Anna made, though? I think the other, um, you know, prong that's really important to um, focus on is building the base of... Um, what I would call um, South Australian green lighters. So that is um, people like writers, directors, producers, production companies who have the ability to green light a production. So they, uh, there, there are certain, um, you know, of the of that class of of people who their market value is sufficient to to tick it over into this is a go project. So as Anna said. When you have a green lighter that's South Australian based, they are naturally incentivised to make that production happen in South Australia. So they want to site it here um, because then they can work from home for six months instead of having to travel and do that. Um, they can work with their um, creative collaborators that they've kind of made so, men so much work with. Um, so I think that as well as attracting you know, the, the large-scale international and interstate production to South Australia, the more that we can build that base of the people who are our biggest advocates and, uh, and champions out there in the market, international market, bringing production back here because they're based here, mm. you know, that's, that's the way we're going to build a really solid foundation. Um, so, Anna, I'm really curious. I mean, you're obviously really good at picking a winner. <laughs> so, so what does it what does it take? What is what what uh, what's? I mean, obviously, you need to be good at pitching um, your story, and you're very good at it. I can see that yeah. you're very convincing, and uh, you can have the whole audience, uh, you know, <laughs> giggle immediately. So, uh, um, what what does it take to pick? It? I mean, what are you looking for? Is it the content? Is it the story? Is it a whole lot of different ingredients is coming together? It's a really disappointing answer, <laughs> okay? But you all work in business, so I expect you to be um, sympathetic with this. We pick the film that we can finance, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's it. And there are, there are films that we love, and they sit up there on the whiteboard, and they gather dust, and we pick up the, you know, the rays, and we want to rub them off, and we go, oh, we just love that film, but we're never going to finance it. So we're looking for the key factors that make that financeable. Um, and if you're a film producer, you know, and you're not producing a film, then what are you doing? It's like, it, you've got to be so tough with where you're going to put your resources. We're using our own resources, or we can get a bit of development support from Screen Australia or from the South Australian Film Corp, but it's your time, it's your opportunity. So you are looking for factors that 
make you feel as though you can get that to the market and people are going to love it and they'll come on board. So, ideally for us, we come on board as late as possible. It can take four years to develop a feature script. So, if somebody comes in, all right, th these are my four pillars. I'm giving this away, right? <laughs> <laughs> you want... Uh, if, if a film is sitting there on your whiteboard, you've got a director attached who's just won an award out of Cannes or Sundance and everyone's going, what are they doing next? The script is fantastic. Everybody's read it and it's appeared on the Hollywood blacklist. <laughs> an actor loves the director and they're already on board and it's an A-list actor and it's, I don't know, I mean, it's, it's hard to pick an A-list actor now because things have changed, but let's say it's, some high, it's Zac Efron because I would love to put him on a film. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> just want him in our office. I think he'd suit the furniture. Um, and finally, <laughs> that there's like three million in private equity that's already attached to the project. If that project comes in, you're 100% up every one of those four pillars. Like, if you can't finance that project, then I don't know what you're doing. There's some other problem there, <laughs> okay? So it's imp nearly impossible to get that. So you're looking at how far up those four pillars are you? And it might be that someone's come in and they love a project and they're putting private equity and it's theirs, they're taking the risk, and everyone else is quite new. And you, you go, well, we're going to take that because we can, we can build this on that. So you, you are looking for what can you take to the market in the shortest amount of time possible and have the most effective outcome so that you are in production in the shortest possible time. Mm. So basically it means that by the time you get to those four pillars, a lot of work has, has, been, done. has been done. And we also say, because we have access to these incredible incentives in Australia, and I've been in CoPro Labs in Toronto, and I still think, aside from New Zealand getting 40% rebate on their television content, we only get 20%, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> um, we, I think Australia has got the best incentives. So we look for Australian originated content because it needs to be in order to tick the boxes to get those incentives. So Australian originated content that's internationalised for a global audience. So it has to have a key Australian creative attached in order to maximise that funding. It doesn't have to necessarily be set in Australia. It's a holistic it's a holistic look, um, but the international elements, so somebody like Netflix or an international sales agent or a distributor in Germany is going to be excited about that project. It can't just be a parochial little... No. Not, I mean, not for us. There are lots of great companies in South Australia doing really good work and, and <laughs> we're all doing different kinds of work and that's incredibly important. That's true, but I think it's, it is also true to say that you know, being a successful film production company these days or screen production company, you know, you need international finance to make your production happen, to get it off the ground. And I think that it's really interesting to note that the screen sector, um, the, of the screen sector, 43% of businesses export regularly. Whereas, you know, across all other industries, I think the average is um, something like 7.5%. So the screen sector is already, you know, way ahead of the curve in terms of its international engagement and, mm. and attracting um, investment and, and, you know, getting revenues back into, South, into Australia from, from international sources. But I actually think there's huge potential mm. for even more growth in that space, like our main export territories are the UK and the US, um, and we're really not tapping the Asian markets at all or, you know, a whole lot of um, really important markets around the world. So there's so much potential there. Well, I, I just want to add to that just in terms of the size of the industry globally. And as we know, a lot of the content and the money comes out of the US. But Netflix last year spent uh, 12 billion on content. Uh, Viacom, Warner Media, um, and Disney spent between 13 and 14 billion. This is US billion last year, uh, and then I think it was um, uh, Universal uh, projected 43 billion on content mm -hmm. last year, including sport. Mm -hmm. The CEO of Showtime predicted that it will be 100 billion spent 
on content, on just television content alone in 2020. So the opportunity for Australia and other territories um, is enormous, absolutely enormous. The demand and hunger for content globally is only increasing and we're seeing, of course, a proliferation of the streaming platforms. You know, Disney's about to launch or has launched, about to launch, Apple's launched. It, we are in a very golden moment, I believe. Would you would you agree to that? Just in terms of not only international but domestically, the in, the industry could grow, and we could really see uh, we would be on the same playing field as you know Canada and the UK in terms of the size of their industry and what they're able to do. Absolutely, the the demand for content is exploding, which means opportunities. Um, and also, I think the other thing that's really interesting is that with um, the different subscription providers um, all trying to kind of crack their own market um, or crack, crack international markets, um, the demand for localised product is really growing. So um, right. the demand for, you know, authentically Australian product, authentically Indian product, authentically Chinese product, like, lo you know, local language um, product, that's all growing. So that is creating a really diverse um, marketplace, I suppose, for producers to play in, which yeah. is means there's just it's mm. a golden age for we, we don't have to moment. pretend we're doing american films yes because they not they were complaining out of toronto the independent american producers so this was in september that the buyers in the market were looking for more uh, what did you just say local language so yeah, localized local, content. localized yeah. content yeah, yeah. Mm. That, that that's what they were looking for, um, um, content that was going to have a lot more scope to go into their niche audiences because yep. those streamers know exactly exactly. who's watching. With Mother, uh, with I Am Mother, we had our call with Netflix marketing, um, I think it was nine days after it was released. Mm -hmm. They do release figures. They say they don't, but they've started to direct to producers. It was one in the morning. You're sworn to secrecy that you can't say. But they knew exactly the the um, their community who were watching that film, watched what they watched before, watched they, what they watched after, which artwork they responded to, mm -hmm. um, so which poster they clicked through, all those demographics. So those infographics, I think, and the algorithms have given the global market a lot more confidence mm -hmm. to not just feel that they need to replicate something that's a generic kind of American mm -hmm. film. They yeah. want exciting stories, original stories with passionate storytellers and of course we can do that here. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so, so if there's such a high demand for so this Australian story, or st Australian product, w I mean it, it doesn't drop from the sky. What does it take to <laughs> produce, to bring about yeah. this Australian product a and what can and I think also universities perhaps have a role to play here what can we do to to bring this I bring these exciting stories uh, to share them with the world I think as an audience we can support it because mm. if there's a market for it an audience that just generates more demand for the content to be created in the first place mm -hmm. So that's the responsibility of everyone in this room. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so go watch audience. Australian films. <laughs> that's know, know your audience. You know, if yeah. you're teaching people at university, maybe don't tell the burning story that you've got in your heart that's going to sit on the whiteboard. Really try and understand what people are buying out of the markets. Mm -hmm. They should read the headlines for The Hollywood Reporter and Screen Daily. You know, if they're creating content, I mean, you're all business people. You don't just go, oh, we're going to make a sweater in purple. You're going to do some <laughs> research and <laughs> make sure that that's what people want. So really, yeah. like, well, there's nothing we want more than someone coming in with a project that we can get behind because mm. we know we can find um, finance, you know, backers for it. Mm. So, But I think as well, you know, I think, um, you know, following the lead of... Um, the Technicolor Academy, I think we can also look to create, you know, um, stronger pathways for, you know, creatives and technicians coming out of the, you know, schools and, and educational institutions and training organisations and just sort of really um, establishing clear, clear sort of career pathways for people because it is really tough emerging out of those institutions and then the jump from there to kind of professional is quite significant. So the more that we can create those pathways, keep the good people, retain the, the skills and knowledge within the industry and support the new creative voices because, you know, it actually makes good business sense 
to back diversity right now because of the, the demand for that um, authentic local content. So, um, you know, diversity is... Uh, finding, finding new, diverse, authentic voices is also really important. Mm. So what can we... I mean, if we, I think we have enormous creative talent here in South Australia. Mm. But it's often like one... The classical story of a, of a creative is very ambitious obviously they want to be on the stages of the world as well and then that dream about going somewhere else mm. and so the first opportunity they leave SA and they may go first to the New South Wales but you know and so forth so what can we do to keep those creatives here to really have a strong base a strong community of creatives here in in, in South Australia what does it take? What's what's missing? Well, how can for we? For some reason, <laughs> we, we all come back. Mm. So I mean, you could look out here and say, well, how many of you have worked in Hong Kong, Singapore, UK? Mm. You know, and um, so incentives will bring you back mm. because when you're trying to finance that film, you go, I am so South Australian right now on this application. <laughs> you know <laughs> that. When we were talking about this at lunch, when you have children, you know, you go off and you work in your markets everywhere, and then you want your children to grow up somewhere safe and um, accessible. So there are other reasons that bring people back. I personally think people leaving who work in the creative arts I think it's so important mm. so we have an intern today in the office I'd like to be able to pay her but the resources make that challenging but she's just come back from New York she's an Adelaide girl she's graduated from uni here took herself off and did an internship for three months in New York and um, and we said yeah come in you know because we want the more they know about how the industry is working internationally, the better chance I think they're going to get a foothold mm -hmm. um, and be valuable mm -hmm. um, locally to themselves or to whichever organisation they're going to start working in. Mm -hmm. It's like, go away and come back. Mm -hmm. It's a very South Australian thing. Yeah. Oh, look, I like it here and I'm not from a South Australia, yeah. so um, <laughs> it works for me. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Um, Kate, can we talk a little bit? You just took on a, a, a new role. Um, yes. And uh, can you talk a little bit about some of the projects and some of the things that you're working on or, or aiming for? Yeah, so, um, yeah, I've been in the job for three weeks, which isn't a very long time. And what I've been doing is really a, a wide sort of consu consultation period, really. Um, meeting with industry, meeting with... Um, international industry, interstate industry, working out why, what makes South Australia um, competitive right now and what could we be doing better. So that process is ongoing. So I haven't kind of formed, I don't know that I'm going to um, jump into any, you know, preempt that process too much by jumping into any, um, this is what we're doing next. Uh, but uh, one of the things that's happening at the moment as well is um, I'm part of a committee called the Screen South Australia Advisory Committee, which Minister Pasoni has put together to look at how can we maximise the competitive advantages of the state and, you know, the infrastructure and the workforce capability that we have here and how can we um, take those conditions and achieve substantial growth in the screen sector. So, for example, one thing I am really excited about is um, looking at the games industry. Uh, so, um, uh, we have just established a games innovation fund, um, which is um, a, a sort of a, an incubator type fund just with small pots of money, just to kind of start the process of um, incubating some South Australian owned IP intellectual property, um, which I think is really important to um, create those conditions for, for people to um, develop IP in South Australia so that when those projects convert into production, um, the, it means the revenues are going to come back here. And as Anna said before, that's what you know, is going to create sustainable businesses in South Australia. So the, gra the games industry is... Uh, um, an area of huge growth and huge potential for South Australia. So I think um, at the moment uh, the stats show that 85% of Australians regularly play games. Uh, so people don't even realise they're pay playing games, but it really is, um, you know, something that I think permeates 
Australian lives now to a huge degree and will continue to do so. So, you know, we see games as part of the screen sector because really it is, it's IP creation, it's production, and it's um, taking those products out to the world. And in many cases, you're taking, you know, the games industry is taking it direct to audiences in a much more direct way than actually the film and television industry are. So, um, you know, having said I'm not going to preempt it, my process, I'm just <laughs> telling you right now, <laughs> that's one thing I definitely am looking at. But Kate, there's also an intersection with games and film too. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mortal Kombat being exactly. an example right. point, of, and yeah. you know, um, Tomb Raider, and you know, there's various other films that are obviously come from the origination of the game. So, you can really see the synergy between those two industries. Yep. Yeah. Even from a talent standpoint, there's uh, cross-pollination between games and visual effects. Yeah. Most of the other yeah. uh, major visual effects hubs in the world are also major games hubs. Yeah. And that just adds the ability for an artist to be able to see you know, opportunities in, in, in various places. And that's not even talking about VR and AR, which are mm -hmm. two emerging markets that were just at the very beginning of. So mm. the more we can cross-pollinate across the different industries, the better it's going to be for everyone. I agree. Yeah. Mm. Wonderful. So we've uh, at the end of, of our time. So thank you so much for this uh, very I interesting discussion and very insightful and inspiring as well. Um, so thank you very much. And thank you also for the audience uh, for sh being here with us and sharing this conversation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>